So good afternoon. I am Anto Budiarjo. Welcome to Monday Live. This is something that we do every Monday um, to help us get through the pandemic and figure out what's on the other side. Um, and um, the panelist profiles are on mondaylive.org. Uh, a reminder that the views expressed on this call are personal, not uh, of any company or organization. Uh, please do post um, comments and uh, questions on the, on the tool and the Zoom tool. Uh, especially today because we really want to make this uh, a very sort of interactive um, uh, show today. Um, please do complete the, the, the survey at the end and this deck is um, available on mondaylive.org. So before we get going, a few slides that uh, some of us have put together um, and uh, before that the agenda, I have a chit chat and we're going to spend most of the, uh, the show today talking about what we should be focused um, on 2021. Last week we were talking about 2021 in the sort of the abstract. We've all kind of decided this is a good thing that we need to continue and um, now we need to figure out what we're going to talk about and some sort of tweaks in the format that, uh, that uh, we'll talk about as well. Um, so this is Mark Petock um, talking about the Haste Pro Project Haystack Connections. Um, I'm sure um, um, he'll speak a little bit about this in a second. Uh, Ken Sinclair uh, still on the innovation uh, angle, which is uh, really strong for um, uh, January coming up. Um, Ken's always uh, a few weeks ahead of us. Uh, Jim Butler talking about Amazon Monitron, which is kind of intriguing. Um, the link is there for, for people to follow that. Um, and also the JCI and Microsoft um, uh, uh, announcement. Uh, Therese talking about um, just getting back to the office. Uh, it's a consistent um, uh, theme of, um, of Monday Live. Um, I, I read this uh, article in uh, Atlantic, um, really sort of interesting. Um, and you know, COVID eyes is a word, uh, apparently. Um, and the, the reason for this is that obviously, this is not just about COVID. This is about how science is changing and how we're changing uh, how we um, look at science. So this is kind of an interesting article mm -hmm. if you're interested in reading a very long article, which Atlantics normally are. Um, Roger uh, talking about real estate core and the, uh, again, the um, Azure um, uh, digital twin uh, stuff um, and um, uh, how that uh, fits in and the JCI uh, announcement. And that's the slides. So I'm gonna stop sharing and um, who wants to start? Anybody inclined to start? Mark, do you wanna? Sure, so Project Haystack, which everybody on the call is quite familiar with, we are pleased to announce that the winter slash fall issue is now out and about some fabulous articles written by the Haystack community. And it's available on uh, projecthaystack.org and encourage everybody to go download it, take a look at it. And um, some really good content on tagging, modeling and so forth and so on. So there you go. Great stuff. We should all do just that. Jim, you wanna talk about Monitron? Yeah, so we've talked uh, before in this group about how the big IT players um, are, how to say, edging into the building space. And uh, this particular offering, Monitron by Amazon, is not really buildings focused, although you could certainly see applications uh, to the big pieces of machinery that are in larger buildings. Um, but I thought what was interesting is that Amazon, just like they did in the home, is now offering hardware that's tied to uh, their cloud services. That is, there are devices that go along with this Monitron service for uh, looking at rotating machinery. And uh, if you purchase um, the service and the devices, then you'll install them on your, let's say in your big air handler uh, fans and 
connect up the gateway to the Amazon cloud. It's sort of a do-it-yourself uh, monitoring solution with Amazon in the background. So I thought that was particularly interesting. Yeah, um, great. And uh, the link is there on the, on the slide deck, which is uh, on the site. Uh, Therese is not here, so we'll uh, get her when she shows up. Um, I, uh, Roger, want to pick it up and also talk about the real estate core and the Microsoft JCI? Yeah, sure. The real estate core is something guys, uh, I think it started up in Scandinavia where the guys were looking for getting some sort of ontology, but obviously build it on uh, Microsoft Azure, but also tied it in with the Azure Digital Twin. So it's, it's really, uh, you know, getting back into, as Jim said, you know, with the big guys getting involved um, with our industry now more and more. Obviously, Johnson's have jumped on exactly the same thing, um, just utilizing it and expressing about the Open Blue Digital Twin and, and Azure. So I think, uh, you know, we can expect to see more of this when you actually recognize, you know, how much of the global economy is is really state and construction, you can understand why these guys might want to get into it. And, uh, you know, they could, they're, they're looking obviously not particularly at the the, the, the field end, more, more the uh, uh, cloud end where they can offer services and tools to actually help people build whatever they need, as long as they get that information back to, to obviously their cloud. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, just more and more stuff where, where companies are getting engaged the big guys getting engaged with our industry again. Let's just open it up for discussion. Jim, were you trying to say something? You're muted. No, you were not. I'll, I'll throw a comment out there. Even though I didn't get a, get a slide to you uh, this week. Uh, on it, so. um, you know, two thoughts. First of all, I do want to echo Mark's comments um, about Haystack Connections Magazine. You know, we publish two issues a year and it's again, demonstrates that you know there's this worldwide community dealing with the issue of if we're going to use data we have to tag it so it has some meaning um, you know and it, it so it shows two things one obviously in the haystack side but the other that more and more of our world of controls people is they're getting involved they don't really have a choice right if you're going to work with data you have to deal with the semantic uh, modeling no matter which approach you use so that's that's really good um, but that's out and, you know, shows the continued advance there. And the other point I make is a follow up to uh, Roger's comment, you know, and we, we are we are in both roles, Haystack and Skyfront, we're watching what's happening in his industry and see these announcements about, um, you know, the IT companies, Silicon Valley companies move. And, um, you know, just a, a thought I had was it's interesting, they're doing things that will add to the utilization of building systems and data. None of them are trying to solve the major problems we have with building systems, right? Why is it, you know, that you see maybe on some of the other forums out there, the challenges with protocols, challenges with integration, challenges with different manufacturers, service support, all of the mucky stuff that a lot of us on our call, on this call has spent our lives wrestling with, which is one of the biggest, I would say, points of consternation of customers, right? Is the messy stuff about doing this with buildings? None of them are, are that I've seen, happy to be proven wrong, are helping solve that part of it. Yeah, you they know? don't want to get their fingernails dirty, right? Yeah, yeah they, they, you know, but that's it. It's really interesting. Great, so you can do, look at these wonderful things you can do, right? And in <clears> fact, <throat> we deal with this, you know, in, in my day job, right? Look at the dumb wonderful things you can do with the data. Oh crap! Is it hard to get data out of this system, this system, this system, this system? You know, I mean, that's not going away. Right? And if, if anybody wants you a word word of warning as well, I don't know. It's probably before you guys got up, but the whole of Gmail and Google and everything went down this morning for about thirty minutes. So, if your building or your services were dependent on that, um, you might want to think a little bit more. John, why why is uh, there such an interest in everyone creating a new ontology on their way into this business when you've already spent, you know, the better part of a decade trying to yeah. do that? Yeah, we turn ten year uh, haystack turns ten years in March. You know, I, I would say that's one of the most disappointing things I've seen because you know 
which, you know, we've seen announcements by other companies with other ontologies. And one of the things they say is they're open source, which is true. But the, here, here it was one big difference, I believe, with what Haystack did. It was developed by an open source community effort. So hundreds of people chimed in. It wasn't like someone went in a room, we did it, we handed it, yeah, it's open source, do what you want. Hundreds of people wrestled with how we're going to model electrical distribution systems and chillers and air handlers, you know, all of that hard stuff. So it wasn't just the end result is open source code. It was an open source development. The other thing that, you know, I don't understand is, especially from the point of view of Haystack, is we've tried to be as open as you can be, come in, tell us what's missing, expand the standard, right? You know, okay, it needs X or Y, great. You know, we should all be collaborating to solve this universally. It seems incongruous to me that, you know, companies that depend on standards being adopted have chosen not to do that, not to even attempt to collaborate. You know, we reached out and have collaboration with the BACNIC group and 223P and had collaboration with BRIC for a while there. You know, it's shades of the protocol wars, which only set our industry back and aggravated customers. I don't fundamentally understand it because by itself, agreeing on a methodology for semantic modeling has no commercial value to any individual person. It just makes I everything. agree. I agree completely. And uh, but the, the thing that uh, that I don't understand is why they believe that uh, a new ontology is going to be a good thing when they don't even have the domain knowledge that those hundreds of people that have been contributors to the, the previous bodies of work have. So and, and Jim, uh, that, I don't get it either. Jim, I don't get I, I, that to me right there is what you just said. The experience, the domain knowledge by the folks within the built community who help and continually contribute to Haystack each and every day is invaluable. And these are the folks that uh, have lived it uh, and live it each and every day versus some of the other newer ones coming in. Just to, to your point is the domain knowledge isn't what it is like it is within the project case that community. Right. Um, sorry, I was going to do a quick poll. I mean, just to go back a step, and, and John, you're probably closest to this than anyone. But how often, uh, to this day, I, is everyone still explaining the need for tagging an ontology in the first place? I mean, every end user SI I come across, I am still Oh, the absolutely. fundamental yeah. education. I spend in, in my haystack work, I still spend the majority of time I'm conversing with potential users. It's at the basics, not yeah. at the advanced level. The, yeah. You know, I, I've said before that you don't understand the need for semantic modeling until you run headlong into the problem. Then you go, oh, <laughs> that's, that's why I have to have a common you know, vocabulary and taxonomy and stuff to get to my end result without redoing it every time. But yeah, I spent, I, I still, I could probably spend 90% of my calls with the first PowerPoint we ever put together in 2011. Yeah. And, and I, I am the same, right. I'm, and I'm just wondering if to answer Jim Lee's question, part of the challenge, Jim is, you know, people are asking fundamentally, why do we even do it or what's the need or they don't even understand the need. And then, and then, when you get past that hump, then we start to say, well, and then there are competing guys and then everybody just gets lost immediately. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. collaboration is the only way this, in, this is actually gonna get solved. You know, I'll go back to my Tritium days and then I'll stop. I mean, back at Tritium, you know, one of the things we did was integrate multiple protocols, right? And, you know, we used to have a joke because it'd be a new protocol announced, you know, a new standard and we'd go, great, we love protocols. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But we don't love multiple ontologies because this is just going to add more work. So now what's a system integrator going to do? They got to build a mapping tool between ontology one and two and three because the owner's going to get, he's going to spec this one, this one, or this one. We have advanced marginally a tiny bit, but we haven't solved the problem for industry, you know, so. Yeah, T T Therese uh, just made a comment that maybe it's the the cloud companies are obviously competing against each other, Azure, Google, and and uh, as, um, AWS, and maybe this is an area where they're trying to compete in. And the fact that they don't know the nitty gritties 
they're all kind of on the same level. Uh, yeah. You know, the analogy I, uh, to me, is personally that I found most helpful is, you know, go back to the early days of the web when, you know, HTML, right? There was a markup language to mark up text so that we could all agree on how we're going to read it, right? And what if I had to have a different engineering effort to go to everybody's website? Well, I remember back early enough, there were websites you couldn't hit with Netscape because they were a little further ahead in HTML and you couldn't hit it with Microsoft's first entries and whatever. And that took years of pain, right? And then HTML5, pretty much everybody. Well, I would think that there'd be an acute awareness of that by Microsoft, Google and others, right? And they would do what they could to not go through that painful cycle and let's get to HTML5 equivalent standard and tagging. And if that means joining Haystack and adding all kinds of things we have missed, haven't thought of, haven't gotten to yet, let's do it together. But it's not but what I, I see happening out there. So. I see it's interesting as well is that when, when sort of the big bigger four guys in the uh, controls industry started out in the cloud stuff, they wanted just like they thought about originally was Hey, let's bring it back into the Honeywell cloud. Let's bring it back into the Johnson cloud. Let's bring it back so that they kind of had some proprietary hold over the information and could again perhaps lock the customers in, which is what they tried to do, and you know, which is what they did years ago. Thank God everything's much open now. But and they were drag kicking and screaming. Now they've gone the other way and going, hey, we're working with Google and Azure and AWS because they had to do that. So now, whether whether the other, you know, whether Google, Microsoft, and AWS, and guys like that will eventually come around to thinking differently because every time they go to do something on site, they actually find that there's different ontologies there rather than the one the industry wants to utilize. Who knows? So, so John, have you had the opportunity to talk to anybody at Microsoft? As an they example? made no. They th there is no evidence. That, sorry about that, guys. There, there's no evidence that they made any effort to contact us to, you know, review at a deeper level, to ask, to collaborate, to tell us we were all full of crap or whatever. Um, on Google, I think Brian Turner, who's probably not on the call, he can comment on the time he spent with them talking about Haystack. And of course, mm -hmm. he's got a project where he's going to he's going to build mapping between the t ontologies. Great. Right. And will he sell it? Will it? You know, how will it get to the world now we have mapping? Um you know, it, it, I just don't understand why we the industry doesn't want to get. Back. Yeah, I'm just I'm just looking across the board here. Um, I'm not sure through my relationships with intelligent buildings. I know they've got a really they've got key contacts inside of Microsoft. Um, so I'm just wondering who else on this panel might have um, have contacts where we could you know, advance these discussions because they, they, they need to stand up and pay attention. The arguments are, are solid. So why, why are they reinventing the wheel when they can just cooperate with a 10 year effort? Uh, but if they don't, but if, if we aren't knocking on their door, then uh, everybody's going to lose out of this thing. Well, yeah, but you, you know, you're knocking your door too late. I mean, I wish we knew, you know, we could have tried harder, but I don't think Haystack was invisible to anybody looking to work yeah. for an ontology in this industry. And the, and the other thing is, you know, no one would be happier than me and, and Mark. If someone came out, I don't care who, and waved a wand and made this problem go away, holy smokes, I'll turn in my Haystack business card. I mean, give me a break. Yeah. This is just a, an impediment to the future of efficient, smart buildings in the IoT. That's all it is. Okay, um, this is a topic of, of its own that uh, obviously warrants a lot more conversations, but we do need to move on and maybe we'll come back to this. Uh, to the main topic of this particular show, which is really to talk about 2021. Um, we, uh, this group had a, a meeting last week. We have a sort of a, a call every Wednesday just to chit chat and figure out what we're gonna do um, uh, in the following weeks. And um, we've kind of made a decision that we're going to change the format a little bit. Um, one of the problems that we've had with this is that it's, it's, uh, it's actually a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing is uh, the, these, these uh, shows are quite um, impromptu. Uh, you know, everything's kind of fresh. We don't plan very much um, ahead. We plan like four days ahead, which is kind of good in a way, but it's bad because it's really difficult to get continuity. 
um, and difficult to sort of um, organize guests and sort of do other things other than just chit chat. Uh, and so what we've decided to do is to create monthly um, topics or themes so that in January of 2021, we will have a topic and I'll come back in terms of what that is. Um, and then all of the Monday sh live shows during that uh, month uh, will be around that topic, right? So we have continuity over three or four weeks, most cases four weeks, that we can talk about that particular topic and that gives us an opportunity to evolve from one aspect of that topic to another, as well as to potentially invite other people in the second or third or even the first uh, of that uh, show of that particular month. So that's kind of the, co the structure of it. And so in February, we'll have a different topic in March, et cetera. So it's kind of a monthly topic um, that will continue the sort of the, um, the, the, the way this, the, the, the calls, are, the, the shows every Monday are, are done around that particular topic on the month, right? So one of the sort of challenges with this is, you know, what are these topics? The topics have to be in a way uh, a little bit broader so we can actually have different aspects of it. And so what we've put together is a poll that we'd like you your input on. And I'm gonna put it up here. Uh, okay, so I've put up the poll. Um, I'm not sure if the, the panelists can see it or not. Um, and I'm hoping that the attendees can see it. I've not actually used this. Panelists can see it, but we cannot vote. Okay, all right. So you don't get a voice. But anyway, if you can, um, attendees out there, if you can um, click on uh, three or four of these and say uh, um, to sort of vote on which ones you think are important, and then we can kind of come back to this and um, um, sort of have a discussion about this. Um, and in the meantime, I think we can, uh, what we want to do is to encourage our, the, the members here uh, to sort of um, argue for one of those votes or one or two of those votes and i don't know who wants to go first anybody want want to jump in or are you too busy looking at the list yeah well let's just leave it up there for for a minute or so well just just as a general rule you know going on what we talked about on wednesday there are some of these things that are going to be ongoing and evolving topics, right? Anything around COVID-19 or uh, impact on, on building space and so forth. So, you know, there are a few of these that are probably going to be repeat topics over time, right? So don't feel like if you vote for one and not the other or whatever, that it's going away. The, some of this, we just won't ever drop completely. They'll be out there all the time. Yeah, good point. Good point. And there could be some duplication there. I mean, if you take the impact of digital twins on smart buildings and then take emerging technologies impacting the smart buildings, they, they may get covered at the same time. Yeah, this exercise is really trying to get the, the, uh, some feedback about this from, from, from the attendees that can actually guide us in, in the discussion on deciding specific topics on each month. I, I, I'm with Chad. I agree that the uh, attracting the next generation is is kind of job number one, and uh, he he basically posted a, a comment there in the Q and A. Uh, the it's it's not only how the industry is going to grow, it is how the industry is going to learn and change and innovate. So I'm I'm seeing that as a uh, just a lot of topics are going to roll a lot of that and. Uh, uh, Gina posted some stuff this morning that was uh, in the bin there too. But, uh, yeah, so I think I think that's a, a real uh, topic that definitely has to move closer to the top. I was going to say, Anto, probably the post-COVID thing is going to probably have to wait till Q2 because uh, I don't think we'll have enough evidence to just to even declare post-COVID until that, at least then. But um, but yeah, I really like the next generation workforce is an early topic. There's, there's really a lot of reasons to focus on that. And, um, you know, I think the other one, uh, we really haven't talked about sustainability um, much. And 
what that means and what it what how it'll change things potentially. But uh, I, I think it'd be a really interesting topic uh, to bring into the picture. That's my vote. I don't know whether it's worth Anton throwing it up on LinkedIn at some stage. It might actually help, you know, publicize a little bit also the what we're doing. Yeah, and that, that's uh, another reason for this sort of change of this uh, format is that we'll be able to sustain a, a topic over time so we can sustain conversations on LinkedIn, which is um, a, a, a very sort of good um, platform for us. Um, yeah. So that's another benefit of, of that. So I think we... Sorry, one more. I got, I'd, I'd vote for the, the next gen workforce, I think, because... In my mind, it's the next gen workforce that are going to provide the emerging technologies and the next thing. And you know, we, a lot of us are getting a little too old in the tooth as far as new ideas and thoughts. I'm, I'm looking for the younger people to, to come and bring those ideas and thoughts. So I need the young people to, to generate the emerging technologies and post COVID processes and stuff. So for me, that's sort of paramount to creating those other follow on items. Hey, Anna, two things. I agree with you. And speak for yourself. <laughs> Actually, I, I would, uh, you know, of course, promoting promoting the the uh, bringing the younger folks in. But I, I think it's what we need to do is we we learned a lot last year and we shared a lot of ideas. Uh, one one problem with, I find with uh, um, Monday Alive is that it's, it's this instantaneous thing. It uh, it it doesn't have a history, and it, I understand that you, Anto probably doesn't want to take on that task of creating it. But it almost cries for a website or something to try and collect some of this information. Uh, LinkedIn is a powerful tool. I use it. Uh, uh, it probably is more important to me than automated buildings at this point. Uh, the network. So I agree with that. Getting it on there. The one problem with uh, LinkedIn is that it is a rolling window in time. So what happens is uh, you really get your message out and everybody reads it that day, but you try and find that message uh, a, a while back. And uh, I think that's one service that we can do as automated buildings is to basically put these links somewhere uh, that they're searchable. Uh, trying to search some of that stuff on LinkedIn is, gets difficult because you have no idea how it's been filed. Uh, you know, it's not filed by subject matter and, and stuff. So uh, I think we have to kind of think about how we're going to do that. And I think if we start some conversations uh, online, either LinkedIn, I, I, LinkedIn, I might be a problem, go right ahead and, and uh, create your LinkedIn article, but send a link to me and I will help you try and promote it and connect it. And we can probably get some discussion and get input from a bigger crowd than where we've got following here, I think. And, and I think that's where we need to go is we need to, we kind of, we got to kind of market this thing and, and these, there's some real good discussion going on here that I think folks would be interested in. And we also need to draw in a whole bunch of the younger folks to, to make this more interesting and more relevant. So um, we did talk about when we originally started Monday Live about creating a, a LinkedIn group and we decided not to. Uh, maybe we'll review that because that that would uh, create a place. Um, so we'll we won't talk about it this 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 moment, but uh, we'll we'll discuss it when we next talk. Uh, I'm going to end the poll and uh... on the poll subject, uh, Anto. Too, I, I'm assuming uh, you know I jumped on a little bit late here, but from our Wednesday discussion, um, the list isn't the end all be all right we're still it's open I, I didn't have a chance to add my ideas today i've had a busy morning um so there's a, a few things that i was thinking about that aren't necessarily on that list for instance so yeah it, it, it is not it is not the end it's kind of an initial stab and i'm going to share the results i think if i do click that button uh, you should all see it um so having said that um the workforce issue is important it's only number, what, four or five out of this, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, technology seems to be important. Yeah. And getting past COVID, understandably, I think that one. Uh, and the data, which is really a sort of a technology angle. 
and also cloud and edge. I think that's kind of the orders and then uh, workforce. You know, some of these topics scream um, to be combined to when I look at the top two there, the emerging technologies and COVID, um, in some cases, in some of the conversations we've had, those two go hand in hand, right? Um, there are new technologies that are being pushed into our space as a solution for COVID or as an aid to the situation like UV and ionization and all kinds of different things. So some of these we might find work nicely together. Yes. No, this is great input. And uh, as Chad just said on the chat, the people have spoken. Uh, so any other any other thoughts and sort of follow on to that? Anybody surprised? No. No, not really. I mean, emerging technologies are always very compelling, right? I mean, they're very interesting and they're state of the art. The one that I was going to suggest that isn't on here was, and it's tied to some of these, but um, bringing it back to our business. When I even look at the list, not only on the screen here, but the list of attendees, you know, I recognize some of the names as either senior staff or, and or business owners themselves. So what are we doing to get our businesses and our companies through all of this kind of ties into the COVID piece of it, but but uh, maybe even emerging technologies too. And maybe the CapEx, OpEx yep. uh, issue. Could be the emerging, emerging, like that is that aspect to it, I guess. The emerging technology thing too, I think uh, what we have to do is uh, the rants I've been going on about with the uh, out of innovation. Uh, when somebody presents us with a new concept, I th what I think the most valuable thing this uh, group provides is that discussion, what do we see drawing out of that innovative uh, emerging technology? And so I think uh, that's like a sub subject that, that has to come and, and as soon as a, uh, I mean, ultimately we're looking for the virus detector, right? Uh, you walk in the building and the alarm goes off and this person has COVID, so we're not letting him in the building. I mean, that's as simple as it is. And any, any technologies that move towards that are, uh, are useful. Uh, Rick Rolson's doing some, some interesting stuff in that area as well. We've got an article on our site. And so I, I think that discussion is important. I think the emerging technology impact on smart, smart buildings is way too big. I think what you should do now, if that's what they wanna talk about, is take that and take 10, 10 pieces out of that that we actually talk about, because it's, it's pretty general. Uh, but I think, in my mind, what it, is, what it is we pull out of these emerging technologies and the innovations, how we're going to use that as an industry. I just, I don't know if I'd, I'd, I'd kind of resist the putting some scope on emerging technologies, Ken, because the, the name in its own context is meant to be broad, right? I mean, I'd, in some context, I'd like it to be encouraging for people to bring new ideas without scope or limit. But I understand what you're saying and that it's a broad subject and maybe there's bounds in, in, a, in a, rather than bounds in the technology, but maybe there's bounds in the application or focus or something like that. Maybe we go back to our roots and we just do it Monday alive because <laughs> it's, we, we don't really want to be, we don't, th I'm not sure we really want to be limited by some of this stuff too. I, I concur with your, your point. This list, in, in, in my mind, actually, so it really limits thought, which I, I'm not a big fan of. Mm. Yes, that, that's, the, that's the dilemma, right? Because of, that's, that's kind of what we've been, we talked about last week is that, that this format is great, except that it's difficult to sort of maneuver, difficult to, to see the flow. And this is an attempt to try and do that. And, you know, after, maybe after a month or two of doing this, if it doesn't work, we'll drop it. That's... Actually, it's just to give an example of that is uh, on for our uh, January issue. We've got an article from Suha, as, who's basically uh, she's she's moving on in the atomic uh, autonomous vehicle space, and 
uh, I quickly, a while back, jumped into the fact that we're actually trying to move towards the autonomous building. And so we, we saw some kindred spirit and we've been pushing stuff back and forth and some of the political stuff she's going through, some of the technology setbacks and stuff, I think it's interesting to share. Uh, it's not a direct hit with, uh, with this group because we, we stay pretty focused. Uh, I, I think actually my function here is to keep you guys on focus. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> You're doing good. Doing good. Uh, just uh, I'll, I'll up you up about you, Ken. Uh, just another um, thing that uh, we discussed last week that will impact um, the the uh, the attendees. Um, we've decided that this particular show will be the last one this year, so that we can spend the next week or so figuring out exactly what we're going to do next year and also take a rest. So. That's just another piece of information to, to take in. Actually, Chad just posted a, a, a thing that reminded me of part of what we're suffering from here too, that Monday Alive is, is replacing, is the fact that we're not all going to AHR Expo. And we would be running our, not only our uh, general uh, programs, but we would have particular programs that you would swoosh people off to in hotel rooms and talk about your latest and greatest. And we're, I think we're all struggling uh, to try and find a replacement for that. And I'm not sure what we can do, but uh, anything, in fact, that maybe, I was surprised that didn't come up with topic. I apologize for not making the Wednesday meeting, uh, but that, that is an, another item that should almost be on there is, is what do we do to replace our physical uh, events. Uh, I mean, we, we came through the real calm and it, it, it's, it was useful, but it's a different kind of a function. And Cochrane's been doing some local stuff. Uh, that, that whole discussion, I think, needs to come out. And I think it affects everybody on this page and it affects the industry as well. How the heck are we going to do this? Um, obviously, automated buildings had a reasonable function at autom or at uh, like the collaborative, the uh, collective yeah. collection community collaborative or yeah, ever what we called it, uh, you know, not having that this year uh, is, is we always had some great discussions there. Uh, how do we replace that? I think, I think that's something we should talk about. Right. So how do we replace that while they, they are not happening, but assuming that there's some kind of normality that returns, you know, how, how do we, have a sort of a hybrid of a com or a combination and actually make best use of both. Because HR 2022 is gonna happen and by that year, all the events hopefully will all, all be going on as normal. So what is our role in that world, which is we all want to return? Well, I would guess, Tanto, that I mean, that without a doubt, every show or, or thing you hold, certainly that was the way with uh, uh, when we used to have the Niagara summits and things, is that 90% of people would tell you that the networking part of it is probably, you know, the best and only part they really want. You know, the rest of it, it's nice to have a show in place, but, you know, uh, uh, the networking is what it is. And there's, as I'm seeing, some people obviously beginning to offer more networking type things. I noticed CRE were doing one the other day. Of, they're doing it for investors as well as people want to come in and do it. So, you know, it may be that there's going to be some sort of hybrid carry on. It doesn't mean to say, you know, it's a temporary thing. It could be that it creates a, a much better thing, you know, more global, uh, certainly, because some of these things tend to be local, you know, to the country. But, it, you know, whatever is on here is, is has the potential to be global. But um, I, I think really the networking issue is something that's got to be tackled because another year without those sorts of things is, is going to be a challenge. How do you bring in new customers uh, to it? And that's where a lot of that used to go on. Well, let me, I've been purposely quiet. So let me ask this to the attendees, the panelists, or whoever is this. So if I'm looking at the industry, we, ha we have great topics, all right, that you posted there. How do, how do these topics... Uh, 
enable or let's call it help get more smart buildings. At the end of the day is there are millions, millions and millions of buildings out here that are not employing technology that this industry builds, delivers and so forth. How can we, how do these topics can get, how, do, how are these topics enabling more of the efforts to make buildings smart, intelligent, automated, so forth and so on? I think it's a good question, Mark, but it's actually it's split in two now and it's becoming more that way because if you look at <clears throat> all the startups, it's, it's post uh, construction. You know, you've got two elements now. You've got the construction phase, which a lot of us have been engaged in all our lives. And now everything's, you know, all the money's being pumped into the services on top of that. And that's where a lot of the activities are. You know, does the BAS supervisor move off site? Does it, you know, to the cloud, does everything go there? And, and I think there's, there's two elements now that is beyond just the smart building. It's also the, the services that have been built on it but it's actually post-occupation. And we've all traditionally been involved in, in that construction phase, which is a big change, I think. But your, your, your point, Mark, is very valid. It's also sort of, uh, it, it sort of goes to question, what is the mission of this group, right? Having topics is nice, but what is the mission? And you're, you're kind of proposing a mission is to actually help um, uh, make smart buildings more normal or more uh, bigger or more, more prevalent. In other more words, prevalent. again, I look at it as this. To me, with as a collaborative industry, if I go stand on a street corner and I see four buildings, are all four of those smart? And again, kind of bringing this in, into picture here or only one of them is smart well how come that one is smart and the other three are not how do we drive more adoption of smart buildings whether to your point roger whether it's the construction side and or the service side because i look at them they go hand in hand now and um so that's where i'm coming from so would would we all agree that that's if not the mission, it's kind of a critical part of the mission. That's or been all of our missions for, for a long time, I think, right? Right, but for this group, we've never actually asked the question, we've never actually stated it. That's. But the problem is there's a bunch of movements such as what the major uh, software companies are doing that are, that are threatening our, our industry and the industry is changing and Roger did a great job of that. Uh, it used to be all about construction. I just kind of like get over it. You think we'll make we may never build another new building. Uh, it's getting it's getting to that point anyway. There'll definitely be less new buildings built. I would not want to have my future planned on construction. I would want my future planned on retrofit. Uh, in Mark's uh, point of three of the buildings on the corner are have, have have nothing done. So I think I think we have to keep looking at the innovation, and we're getting stuff falling on us that is completely different and out of our bailiwick. And I think we need to, we need to discuss that and dismissing it and, and basically discrediting it, I think is valuable uh, and saying poking holes in it. But by the same token, some of this stuff is difficult to poke holes in, it's pretty neat. And uh, we, have to, we have to basically look at that and see how we're going to make that part of our change. Uh, again, that's that's my message that I'm trying to get out to you is the innovation has occurred. The innovation has been rapidly uh, excelled in the in the year of COVID. Uh, we're going into our next year. Now, what is it we can extract out of that? What was useful? What did we learn? The whole remoteness, the, the moving away from the building. Our buildings are at danger. Uh, we have to we have to make them way more attractive. So a bunch of those kinds of things we need to talk about. The part of our challenge, I think, when I just think of this glo globally as a problem, the I think we can probably all agree that 
the lack of adoption has very little to do with the lack of technology, right? The products, the technology is there. The issue has historically been a business issue, whether it be around proprietary nature of things and the desire to keep it that way, or uh, the tenant is paying for the electricity, therefore the building owner doesn't care to make any investments or you know, there's a number of fairly common things that we bump into all the time. And I think that's usually what prevents a building from becoming smart is some reason associated with business as opposed to technology or anything like that. I'd agree you- with that, Tracy, because it's usually the commercial train you know, chain at the beginning that actually knocks all that stuff out. Someone initially puts it all in and then the contractors down the route say, okay, we're going to cut this, cut this, that's out. I know, know about all this stuff that can be done. And then you end up with the, the bones of the thing again, as opposed to what was the original intent. And the, quite honestly, the, until the commercial structure changes, which I'm hoping some of this will, um, it's going to drag down the potential of, of, of really being able to offer a lot of the, the, the technology that's coming out. Yeah. Uh, and that's, another- I think to your point, uh, Tracy, that's where we see the the impact of IoT solutions, right? The IoT guys are solving business problems within the build, buildings, even though they're very vertical and very you know very focused. Um, that's why they're getting the adoption because they're being seen as solving a particular business problem, you know, of the building, whatever that building is, and that's why they're getting the attention. It's very narrow and very focused, but. You know, that's why they're getting it. Yeah, and I was thinking more in terms of like bidding and winning projects. And you know, I've heard Jim Lee go on and on about some of the challenges he has with the procurement side of things. So, um, and, and I know when we come up against something that is like a dead stop when we're trying to win a project or something, it almost always has to do with something like that that's completely out of our control not some, you know, we can solve most of the products or we can find somebody who can solve a product a problem, but um, it's a business issue that kills it. Yeah, okay, another point I'd like to make is as an industry, we've always been in the weeds. There's no doubt about it. I mean, in the old days when, you know, the elevator talk, you try and explain what it is you did and you, you'd never made it before you, you got out of the elevator. Now with IT, they basically, a lot of the stuff, you know, like, it, they, they can relate to it because they're starting to see some of this stuff coming into their home. So I think there's a whole education and uh, this, the protocol or the, uh, it's not the pro- protocol, the uh, on oncology uh, wars that are going on with Haystack. I, I think in the final analysis, even though it's frustrating for Haystack right now, that the, you will actually find that that will be one of the things that will take Haystack out of the weeds and put it into, instead of, uh, uh, 50,000 people knowing what Haystack is, we're now at a situation where we may have, you know, in a short distance, have millions of people who actually understand what a Haystack is. So I think you're in that evolutionary uh, stage of kind of coming out of the weeds and coming into the mainstream. mainstream. And uh, I think what you might find is that when a million people try sort of understand what Haystack is, all of a sudden you're going to double you know, the, the, the 10,000 that were, that were haystackers will now turn into 20,000 and 30,000. We'll start to see sort of an evolution that way. Sure. So I'm, I, I, I'm seeing it all very positive that we're, we're getting a lot of exposure from our, not our industry, so. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and I've, I've talked about our problem being a generational problem as much as anything. And the fact that we are kind of entering a perfect storm with overall consumer acceptance of these kinds of systems. You know, the millennials coming into decision-making positions and so forth, um, along with technology advancements and cost reductions, right? So everything is trending in the right direction, but the problem with all of us on this uh, forum here today is it never happens fast enough, right? So maybe the question is how do we accelerate it perhaps, as, as, as much as how do we get them to even start, so. We need to grow younger, seriously, guys. You need more young faces around here bringing up. We have, we've got this generation that grew up with data. So 
they understand how data works. They understand uh, Amazon services. They understand uh, the Microsoft offering Azure. They come into the offices and now they have to learn Sky Foundry. So it's like, why? And there is reasons why, but they have to learn why to use that. And so there's a resistance there. I think if you can start to see it through their eyes, you'll see a, a kind of a different kind of an evolution. I see a little bit with our consulting company. Some of, some of their thoughts are very, very different and almost anti-traditional uh, anti controls. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure they're not so right. Well, and they certainly have no problem sharing, do they? <laughs> so no, sharing, actually, that's a good point. Sharing yeah. information. Well, if they, they just want to understand. Tell me how this system is better than, than uh, and, you know, like tell, tell me how a Johnson graphic system is better than this open source graphic system. Yeah. Google and, Analytics. And or a Google collection Analytics. of data and stuff. So they're kind of coming at it uh, a completely different direction. The amount they don't know is, is scary, but uh, the, the, the value they bring is amazing. Yeah, I agree. So, so what I'm hearing in a way is that the, the space is getting potentially bigger, whether it's IoT or these big players or the, 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 the big IT players or the, uh, the new workforce that we, we need to bring in. And I would also um, add something like Digital Twin into into that, uh, there's lots of these different sort of um, initiatives that sort of we can latch onto because we're part of that. So part of part of our mission should be to to figure out how what that what that means. Yeah. So that we can grow um, grow and accelerate our bit of it, our contribution to those those big. Um, yeah, and we need to take advantage. I, when we've looked at this problem in terms of controls and IOT, you know, a lot of people kind of see those as, as different technologies and different things. But to me, it's always been more of a mindset than a technology thing, right? The way IOT thinkers go about things has less to do with a nice integrated system. They want to connect a thing, connect a sensor or a control or you know, get to that one point that's going to solve their problem get it on the network and then go, right? And then, you know, where we found our opportunities here lately is connecting all of those individual islands of automation uh, together into an integrated kind of system, right? And in the mindset, once you start thinking like IoT, what I always tell everyone around here, think, think IoT, not controls. And, you know, I want to connect my thermostat to a network and get data and do things with it. Now expand on that, right? And it really is just kind of a mindset more than almost anything I've always thought. Well, that, that? Was, that was my point I was trying to make it earlier, Tracy. I mean, solve a specific business problem, right? Yeah. Rather than trying to be the broad solution to all things just cause. And, and we're the IoT guys, they're solving a specific business problem. And then to your point, the only goes okay what else can i do with this how can i expand on it how can i increase the thing um, that you know that in of itself is an absolute trend in favor of many of us on this call as smaller providers you know we're not i, I don't know everybody on the list here but we're not working for any of the big guys necessarily who would rather capture kind of the whole the whole thing you know we're happy to go in and get our piece of it our specialty and, and that just makes it easier for us to get into some of these things. And then we can expand from there. Well, right. Let me ask you a question, Tracy. Don't you think that really the building controls has already been uh, at site level on-prem kind of an IoT solution anyway? Because you've always been connecting edge things together to work, whether it's the fire system, the lighting system, the controls, the sensors and systems to systems, sensors to sensors. What the difference is, is then getting that data out and using it off site. We've, we've already done most of the stuff at the lower level for years. Yeah. Um, just, that's you know, my okay, follow up line. Smarter, but yeah, that's my follow up line when I, when I talk to reporters or I'm trying to explain this to people, you know, we've been doing IOT for 26 years, right? It always has been, we've always done network, get something onto a network and get it out of your building somehow. It just wasn't called that before. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. 
Yeah, and that, that's always struck me as being strange because you're right. It's 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 basically the same thing, but yeah. well, and it was M to M, and it was you know it had several different names over the years. IoT seems to be the one that has caught on right at the time when it's hitting consumer, you know, world, so to speak. But it, it gets more publicity because it's wider than just buildings. Then it brings in everything, and then suddenly, you know, yes, we are part of it as opposed to just just the building space. So it becomes more acceptable that you can put a, you know, articles in the newspaper or on the on the web, and it, it embraces everything. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. You can, I think that's a really my important eye, point. We actually belong again, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think but it's very too. important. Very important that that no, they I, IoT. I, I think Jim pointed that out at the start. Is IoT had they, they don't understand what we're doing with backnet protocols? Why we have to have this interconnectivity? Why we have to keep on working when Google goes down as it did today? Uh, so a uh, they have no interest in building a controller like Mark builds or. You know, so that whole industry, I think, is ours forever. And not only that, the people, the support of that is ours forever. Because it's just, like, after you can imagine going to a meeting and trying to explain to somebody what it is you've been doing for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And uh, it, I mean, it's, it's so friggin' complicated that we all struggle with it. Uh, so there's no way they want it. It's just, they want, they want the question, where do I connect it? Where can I pull this signal off? And so we're in the business of creating that infrastructure and processing that infrastructure and making it useful and easy for them to use. And we, but what I think is going to happen, you're thinking, oh no, they're taking our business. I think you might want to take a look at it the other way. I think they'll be bringing us business. I see the IT people will be our, our major clients in the future. They will come to folks like Mark and they'll say, okay can you provide those little controller thingies that you put in the building i need i need two thousand of them is that a big number or not you know and 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 for us that's a big number for them it's like i'm not going to build a product for two thousand you know so i think it's gonna it's gonna be a different kind of a world and like i say we're coming out of the weeds we're right. coming mainstream <laughs> so we're coming up to the top of the hour maybe uh i'll ask each one of you to sort of wrap up 2020. This is our kind of last show. 15 seconds each. Okay, let, let me let me quote, uh, if I can find it here, let me quote my slide here, which was what uh, 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 Suda had to say. She's been said, I've been thinking of 2020 has been a nightmare for all of us, unifying us into alternate reality and grounding us to rethink how we live our daily actions and social interactions mean. And I think that's exactly it. And uh, her, the name of her article is Welcome to 2021, the year of healing with innovation. And I think that's a really good message is we, we gotta do some healing. We've, everything's been torn apart and, uh, and we've, we've gone through incredible change. Now we have to figure out what we're gonna do with that incredible change, how we're going to- Great. Thank you. Um, Jim, Jim Butler. <coughs> you did. Yeah, um, I think we've discovered what we can and what we cannot do effectively uh, remotely in 2020. And, and now that we know what we can't, then hopefully in 2021, we can bring some of that back live. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, the changes in work practices and the way we just live and breathe, so to speak, uh, as a result of COVID is going to be in place for a long term, not just for the short term. And lastly, that we're past the crisis mode. We are in a recovery and execution mode. John? That we, uh, I, all I can say is hopeful that uh, we get past this so we can figure out what the next phase is. We is we don't know what the new normal will be. It isn't going to go back to the old normal. So that's see what uh, it Roger. Yeah, I guess my message is that uh, it's been a roller coaster, and I think my concern is everybody now is is actually super busy. I just be careful of the false dawn. You know, you're going to have to be agile as this thing moves on. 
and that's a big message for everybody i think in in 2021 you know they they're doing everybody's doing well again at the moment but be be ready to think because everybody's got their head down doing what they're doing they don't we can't always look forward but i think you're going to need to be agile once we get past this rush of blood we're getting at the moment i know yeah i think uh 2020 was a rate of change of technologies and approaches and life and work that none of us expected. And I think that in amongst all of that stuff, some good, some bad, I think 2021 is, is a, in a, a year to capitalize and make opportunity out of that. Great. Jim Lee? I'm looking forward to a uh, fact-based, science-based 2021. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Remember, it could all come around again. <laughs> we can't Tracy. even get comfortable with that yet. Tracy? Uh, I, I would build on what a number of the people are saying, which is, man, if you didn't believe the only constant is change, you probably do now. And the only way to survive this is that adaptability and um, ability to kind of move with, with things. And, and it really has created a lot of opportunity for, for us, for our industry. In general, and I, I don't by any means think that we're through this in any way, shape, or form yet. We've got a way to go, um, both good and, and potentially some bad, right? So we got to be ready. So my my thoughts is that um, it's it's forced us to do new things. I think many of you have basically said that the the, the same sort of uh, sentiment. Uh, it's forced us to do Monday Live, which. Couldn't wouldn't have happened uh, without without COVID, um, but now we're on a uh, on a, a a new chapter and um, really looking forward to 2021 and uh, the continuing conversation. So, with that, um, let's bring this to a wrap, and we shall see everybody again um, in January, whatever the date is. I don't know the first Monday January of January. 4th. January fourth. January 4th. And uh, until then, uh, the video of this will be up uh, tomorrow. And um, have a um, happy holidays and um, bye bye all. Happy yep. New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Let's see ya. Bye now.